Thank you. Yes, and uh, in what we know and we about you, uh, we appreciate. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, my name is Paul, and as he introduced, Jennifer here. Um, we've been married now 28 years. Added that. Um, we work uh, with East West International Missionary uh, Ministries, which is located, um, thank you, located in Plano, Texas, and we just live north of there in McKinney, Texas. We have uh, four kids, um, three boys and a girl, ages 25 to 18, and we're recent empty nesters. Um, we want to express our gratitude. We're really thankful, Matt. We're, we're thankful, Ron for just the support of this church. Um, it's been a blessing to us, a blessing to Iva and Jean in the years and, and Jen growing up in the community here. But thank you, thank you for your support and just honoring uh, just the work that we have done and, and living overseas and now back in the States. So we have a missionary hero of the faith who is since now with Jesus. He said, always start a presentation with a snake story. So let's start with that story. <laughs> we honor him. So when we lived in Laos, Lomperbong, Laos, and we in our home. And one day I walk into the kitchen and Jen is washing dishes. As she's washing dishes, I see right going by her this snake. And the snake is going right by her feet. And she's just standing there talking, smiling like she is now. I said, don't look down. Matt, what did she do? She looked down. She looked down. <laughs> so as she looks down and screams and yells and jumps out of the way, Paul wants to be the hero. What does Paul want to go do? Grab something to kill the snake, right? What does she do? I don't kill the snake. Can't you just catch the snake and get it outside? Um, she would, she, we have mosquitoes all the time. She said, can you just put it outside? Uh, <laughs> Okay, so here, the next thing I do is I grab this, as a picture, you can see a little bit, the broom, and of course, she's over here taking pictures of me. <laughs> the broom and the trash can, I'm over here trying. So this is a, it's a Thailand tree snake, which jumps from tree to tree. Um, it's a semi-venomous snake, find out later. And uh, you won't die, but you can, you know, be pretty sick. So I'm catching, wrangling it, get in the trash, it's trying to go up the wall, it's stapping at me. <laughs> Put it in the trash, hold it in there, take it outside, and let in the grass, and there you go. <laughs> so, there is our snake story. <laughs> I thought the hero, by the way, was the killing of the snake, but the hero was to try and get the snake out of the house. Yeah, it was out. <laughs> the goal of missions. So, the video showed a state of the world, how we are still, how we still have work, out, work cut out for us as believers. But I want to make sure to share the goal of missions. So we see it in Habakkuk 2.14. Um, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Think about that. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The main goal of missions is for God to receive glory from the all peoples everywhere. Knowledge of glory of the Lord will cover the sea as the waters cover the sea. As the Lord is known and adored, he transforms people, cultures, and the world. You see up here, we have... Uh, we have been involved in disciple-making, church planning uh, efforts among the unreached for, uh, for the last 20-plus years. Many different roles. In fact, um, we call our, our time in missions the funnel, uh, the funnel there. With each faithful, small step in obedience, uh, God would show us another step. We thought the point would be specific destination, but what we found instead was more of God himself. Through the years, we've seen as praying and then giving and then going short-term trips. We also become long-term, as we share, long-term cross-cultural goers. Uh, we're our, our family of six, 
and moved to the communist country of Laos as I shared in Southeast Asia and re out to reaching the Mian people group. When we, turn, uh, when we returned, we joined East West to continue working on behalf of the unreached uh, and unengaged people on immobilizing. Now is more of our role uh, as we pray, give, and go and see that to the darkest places. Taking Jesus. So uh, let me give it. So just the current, our current roles among the unreached. Jen is the uh, Jen is the director of medical outreach uh, that uses medicine to break down uh, gospel barriers, so so people uh, may gain access to the good news of Jesus in places where you just cannot walk in to a village with a Bible. Um, I oversee the missions efforts for training of national partners, church planning work in South Asia the unreached of Latin America in East and West Africa. Okay, so I used to say to our boys, especially all the time, usually the, when they were mischief making, I would say, you're being a bull in a China shop, so just stop it. Well, then they introduced me to this show called Mythbusters. And Mythbusters was this show that would take collective sayings, uh, rumors, things that we believe, and then they would put it to the test, and they would either show it to be truth or a myth. Well, so wouldn't you know it, but they put my saying to the test, and they stuck a whole bunch of bowls with a bunch of China delicate dishes in a small space, and those silly bowls ran around as gracefully as ballet dancers and never knocked over one dish. <laughs> So my saying lost all of its power, and my boys would never let me live that down. So today, we want to bust some myths that surround the missionary call. So first, let's take a saying that you may or may not have heard, and if you've heard it, you can raise your hand. How many of you have heard, the missionary call is only for certain people? Anybody heard that? Well, good. Okay, a few. Um, or maybe you've heard, I'm waiting to be called before I step into missions. Well, we think this is busted. <laughs> now, the reason this is busted is because if you wait for a call before you take steps of obedience, you will just wait forever. Because the fact of the matter is, Jesus has already called us. In Matthew 28, 18, as you know, known as the Great Commission, as well as many other places in Scripture, he's already said, go and make disciples. Therefore, it's not a matter of if we are called. It's a matter of how we are called. How. That's right, how. how? <laughs> so, in our experience, God likes to steer ships in motion. He doesn't seem to steer ships anchored in the dock or their anchor draw or, or tied to the dock. Um, so we invite you today to investigate or explore how God is calling you, not if. Faith seems to be intricately involved in every step of obedience we take, and missions is no exception. In fact, God usually only gives us enough light for that very next step. So in light of the fact that we've all been called, the best way to start obeying and get moving is to take a single step of faith. So what is your next faithful step? Well, just like the video mentioned, you can pray, you can give, and you can go. So those are three practical steps. So let's explore those for just a moment. So this is kind of a busy slide, and we're missing a picture, but that's okay. We'll talk about it. <laughs> So one step you can take is to pray. You can pray for the unreached, like the video mentioned. But it's hard to pray about something that you don't know much about. So we also invite you to learn about the unreached. Some very great ways to learn about the unreached are to, uh, maybe you could adopt an unreached people for the next year and pray about them, either individually, collectively with others, um, to learn more about how to do that, you can visit joshuaproject.org or operationworld.org. Those are two great websites to give you lots of information on ways to pray. You can also take a missions course. Perspectives on the World Christian Movement is a wonderful course. We can't say enough good things about it, and in fact, it will change your perspective. 
Its close cousin, which is a little shorter course, is called Kairos. You could also do a missions Bible study, again, by yourself or with others, such as God's Heart for the Nations by Jeff Lewis. That's the one in black there. <laughs> or there's one called uh, by David Platt, Something's Gotta Change. Or you could even read books about how God has moved in other people. There's a companion book by David Platt called Something Needs to Change, maybe Crazy Love by Francis Chan, or check out the Christian Heroes Then and Now series for great missionary biographies for your kids, and I'll give you a hint, they're great for adults too. Another step you could take would be to give financially, because guess what? Missions, like any ministry, takes money and resources. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we know God owns every single thing. He doesn't need us, but he does invite us in to steward his resources. So we can either invest in temporary trinkets or we can invest in eternal treasures. Now, one step towards investing in eternal treasures might be to adopt a missionary project or strategy, something near and dear to your heart that you could agree to support for the next year or more. Another thing could be to send somebody on a short-term mission trip. And I'm going to give you a little secret. Short-term mission trips change the hearts of the goers. We have known more long-term missionaries on the field who God moved to get them there, and it all traced back to that very first short-term mission trip that they went on. Another thing would be to adopt a long-term missionary and so agree to support them monthly. While one-time gifts are great, missionaries depend on long or on full time, excuse me on monthly support. So in this way, you join with that missionary to partner and become a strategic team to reach the unreached. And then like the video set talked about, you can go to the unreached because guess what? Missions work takes laborers. In Matthew 9, 37 through 38, this is Jesus speaking. He said, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. Now notice Jesus didn't pray for the lost here. He actually prayed that workers would be moved into action. So some ways that you can go is what about vacationing intentionally every year, taking your two weeks and going to the unreached on a short-term mission trip. You can explore midterm opportunities such as YWAM's, YWAM is Youth with a Mission and their discipleship training program, or it's called DTS for short. DTS is a great program. It's about six months long. It takes three months of intense discipleship training, and then it sends you on a team to practice what you just learned for three months. Or East West has a program called Year One, where you go actually as an intern and join a long-term team on the field for about eight or nine months. Or if you feel God stirring something in your heart to go yourself for long-term, start to explore that. I would recommend starting here with your church leaders, your missions team, and letting them know of that so they can help you. You can also find missionary agencies online, uh, such as East West and many others, who can help you explore that calling. And then one thing that the, uh, you can go to the next one. Oh, I did. And one thing that the video didn't mention is becoming a mobilizer. Maybe you're already praying, giving, and going. Well, mobilizing is just taking other people with you as you go do that. Think uh, kind of like Paul mentored Timothy. Who might your Timothy be? You might organize a prayer group to pray for the unreached together. In fact, it's more fun to do things with other people. <laughs> you can champion a missionary need and raise financial givers, or maybe lead a short-term mission trip and recruit others to go with you. Myth number two, but aren't we just missionaries right where we live? So, statements such as this, um, we are missionaries right where we are, right where we live. Your zip code is your mission field, or your family is your mission field. 
They're all a good intentions. While true, it's incomplete. It is incompleteness of this statement that sends a dangerous message. Dangerous because if we adopt the thinking that we're only missionaries and just focus on our individual mission field in our own homes and zip codes, we can adopt tunnel vision. To uh, the exclusion of the vast world beyond our church doors and darkness where there there is not been where there someone can be born live and die and never hear the name of jesus in the gospel message and how many people is that over three billion that's right three billion will born live and die without ever hearing the gospel uh, jesus told us to make disciples of all nations is a better translated all people groups and it means all means all So while it is true that we make disciples of our own, it is true that we make disciples. It is true that we make <laughs> disciples of our own zip code. It is true we make missionaries within our home. We want to make sure the incompleteness that we address too. Um, and we see in Acts 1.8 gives us an entirety of the God's call to go. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, our hometown, in all of Judea, our own culture, in Samaria, a nearby culture, and to the ends of the earth, for Jesus is not known. Okay, but what about another one? The missionary call happens at a definitive, memorable moment in time. Well, busted. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is busted because a well, a definitive, memorable moment in time may be the story for a very few. It's rarely the story for all. You can think Moses in the burning bush. I mean, to our knowledge, God only spoke to one guy through a burning bush. I don't, and maybe there's others, but I've never heard of them. So expecting a memorable, definitive, a moment in time for a calling into mission sets our expectations up to want to see a supernatural event or a special sign from God before we step out in obedience. We have found that instead of a supernatural event or a burning bush moment, God tends to ignite a burning passion in the heart of the obedient over time. So I want to kind of tell you our own call to the mission field um, when we went to Laos full time as, as a family. So the way God led us uh, to Laos, it did start with a burning passion and then confirmation over time. We did not have a burning bush moment. For me personally, it began after the death of our second child, uh, second child Ryan, at birth. All of a sudden, I was confronted with what the Bible calls life is a vapor, the brevity of life. And I began asking, what am I doing with this precious breath God's giving me? Um, this kind of caused a reevaluation of priorities on how am I spending my time, talents, and money? Well, this all led to me saying yes to my very first short-term mission trip to Cambodia, and we were at a church that had adopted a people group, and we kept going back year after year to Cambodia, so I went on one of those trips. And when I got there, I saw vast physical and spiritual need that I could not have imagined. And through tears one night on that trip, when I was praying, I was asking the Lord, how can you let this happen? How can you let such vast need happen? And I felt almost as if God was pointing his finger back at me and inviting me in to join him and saying, you can be a solution. <laughs> and so this started me on a quest to see what was my missionary role? What did God want me to do with, again, this breath he had given me? So when I got back, Paul ended up later going on another Cambodian mission trip, and God changed his heart. And then we were together, and we started trying to seek the Lord for our missionary role. We took perspectives on the World Christian Movement to learn about the unreached, because remember, you can't really pray much for something you don't understand. That course blew us away, and we really started, 
I think a fire started to get lit. So then we started to uh, give to missionary efforts. Remember the funnel? <laughs> we started to go on more short-term mission trips. Then we started to mobilize others and lead short-term mission trips. And all along the way, with one faithful step after another, God kept growing a passion in our hearts. And so as he did that, we started to ask, well, should we go full time? Because that kind of seems like what God's doing here. And then other believers started to confirm that same message. And then that's what led us full time to say yes to go to Laos. So you see, it wasn't a burning bush moment. It was just a burning passion. And this is how we've often seen God work in people's hearts. And, um, and basically for us, as God continued to woo us little by little, we felt almost compelled to go until it felt weird that we would stay home. So you see in missions, the more you obey and step out with little tiny steps of obedience, God grows a passion for himself and for what he cares about, which is reaching and pursuing lost people. Biblically, God has all already clearly commissioned us. So why do we think so many people are not answering that call? Well, we think it might be because they believe this myth, that they're waiting, that they are assuming that they should stay home until God miraculously calls them out. We think a better approach to obedience would be to switch that on its head and to assume you should go unless God talks you out of it. <laughs> so myth number four. This last myth we will tackle is for the role of the long-term and cross-cultural goer only. It states a calling is completely irrelevant to becoming a cross-cultural missionary. Busted. So let's read... If you have your Bibles, let's read Acts 13, 1 through 3. And you can turn there if you would you like, because we don't have it up on the screen. Sorry, guys. So it's Acts 13, and it's just those first three verses. And this says, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and saw, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. The Holy Spirit said, Saul or Paul and Barnabas for the role of cross-cultural goer before the church moved to send them out. This was a clear calling. I know, I know, <laughs> we just said assume you should go. But we did not say go without confirmation. In this passage, while there were several other teachers, prophets gathered, God only chose two to go. No one sat on the sideline. Everyone else also played a missional role. They prayed, they gave, they sent out, and later they would receive Paul and Barnabas back again. God will go in, in power with those he calls. In fact, Jesus promised promises to go with us to the very end of ages. And we want to, we want to confirmation in God's power to go before us because the unreached are that way for a reason. The places left in the darkest, or the darkest places around the, the globe, around the world, are difficult to reach and sometimes hostile to the gospel. The devil has ruled these areas for a long time and will not give up ground without a fight. For the role of the cross-cultural goer, especially a time of preparation is wise, and it would be reckless to go without a clear calling 
from the, from the Lord that is confirmed by the Holy Spirit through prayer and through other believers. You do not want to go onto the front lines of the battle without the Holy Spirit leading the way. Go, uh, God will go before those he calls out, just like he did with Paul and Barnabas. So in conclusion, let's just review uh, uh, these kind of facts that we've talked about and myths about the uh, mission calling. So it's not if you are called, but it's how. How? It is how. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So God has uniquely gifted you to play a role, maybe roles. Ask him where he can best use you to pray, to give, and to go, or mobilize, and or mobilize. Obedience means joining God both locally and globally. Now, not either or, but both and. And he wants you to do it one simple faith step after another. Your mission role or roles may change over time because life is full of seasons, but the point of it will always be experiencing more of God himself. And lastly, for the role of that long-term cross-cultural goer specifically, start with the premise that God wants you to go. Pray, seek confirmation over time, and then ask God to talk you out of it if he'd rather you stay home. We just want to thank you again. And I want you to know that, you know, we really do, and I know I've talked to a few out in the lobby of those you support and the missionaries um, that we would have come up now, if you wouldn't mind, please. We want to say, you know, that Red Rocks Fellowship, this is special, you know, this to opportunity for us to come and share and to have us share this Sunday. Matt, it's, thank you. Red, <laughs> church, thank you. Um, this is um, just a blessing to us to be able to have this opportunity to share. Is there a microphone? Yeah, the mic. Oh. So uh, first, I'd like to have, uh, is it Daniel? Mark. Mark. Mark, you want to share? There you go. Yes. Yes. Why don't you all go up on the stage? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Try that one. That one works. Good morning. My name is Mark Jones, and I'm with Missions Door. Um, My wife, Kim, would be up here with me today, but uh, we just had a grandchild uh, born two weeks ago. There were, uh, she was born a little bit early, and there were some complications with lungs. Um, and uh, the mother also had a, some complications, so my wife is up in the uh, Iowa area um, loving on uh, the child and the daughter-in-law. So that's why she's not here. Um, again, I, I serve with Missions Door, a, which is a global ministry that partners with indigenous missionaries in uh, the U.S., Canada, Mexico, Um, Central America, Caribbean, uh, lots of different places, Africa, Eastern Europe, um, the Middle East. My primary goal with Missions Door is that I lead short-term teams to our indigenous missionaries, whether that's in the U.S. or abroad. And I help our indigenous missionaries, which most of them are pastors, to reach their local communities with the, with the uh, message of Jesus. Um, I, I speak Spanish, so I tend to go to the Spanish-speaking countries because I'm more familiar with those cultures. Um, I grew up as a missionary kid in Brazil where they speak Portuguese, a similar Latin language. 
another aspect to my job is that in the last couple of years, I was named a regional team director with Missions Door, which essentially means that I lead a group of 10 missionaries that work in the US as Missions Door missionaries. Um, I supervise them, we meet together on a monthly basis. Any new missionaries that might come through Missions Door, uh, I assist them with that process. Um, one in particular just joined Missions Door who speaks Swahili and he will be helping another missionary here in the United States that is doing um, training for lay leaders in the church and he'll be translating all of that training into Swahili and leading uh, those kinds of groups and trainings. So that, that's pretty exciting. That just happened a month ago. Let's see. Um, regarding uh, receiving a call to become a missionary, um, I received a call to become a missionary many times <laughs> in my life. Uh, my parents, as I said, were missionaries with Wycliffe Bible Translators, so that, in my mind, would be a calling. I was called through my parents. After that, when I was in high school, I went on short-term weekend trips to Mexico, and then later on in high school, my senior year, I went on a um, six-week trip to Colombia, where I really felt the call to go on that trip, too. Later on, after I was married in 2003, my wife and I really felt like God wanted us to go to the Dominican Republic with our two children who were at the time six and eight years old. And to go to the Dominican Republic in a very poor area was definitely a calling. <laughs> we, uh, that, that was, a, it was, it was, we really needed to be called to go into that situation. Um, so those are a couple examples of being called before I became a missionary with Missions Door. So the way it happened with Missions Door was that I sensed, because I had been leading short-term trips, and then I started seeking a place to lead short-term trips as a missionary kind of full-time, and I found a place called Missions Door. I had never heard of Missions Door, like many of you may have never heard of Missions Door. And uh, I went into the office to talk to them, and the person said he had been praying for two years for somebody to lead short-term trips on their behalf in, in that capacity. And he happened to be from the Dominican Republic, where I had just been ministering for uh, several years. So that um, was a great... Um, way for God to confirm the calling that he gave me to become a missionary with Missions Door. So my question to you today is, where is your Missions Door? We're talking about being a missionary wherever we were at. And as was mentioned, it can be your zip code um, with the idea of also looking beyond your zip code, right? That's what we just heard. So the door that God wants you to walk through might be your neighbor's house initially. It might be the coworker who is in the cubicle next to you or however your coworker works <laughs> on Zoom, <laughs> maybe nowadays. But my point being that God has a door for you to walk through in missions. And um, where is that door? I'd love to talk to you on the table over on the right after this service. Thank you for your time. Hi there, I'm Tammy Snowden. It's great to be here with you guys. I am is what I am as I am considered a second career missionary. So if my first career was in sales. I was in medical sales here in Denver and I loved my job. I was a great sales rep. I was number 1 in the nation for my company many many years in a row. 
But, um, and during that time, I had a heart for missions. I went on short-term mission trips. I started my first mission trip in eighth grade. So don't ever think that children can't develop a heart for missions at a young age. So at eighth, eighth grade, I went on my first trip. I was involved and served on mission committees. I went on many short-term trips. I took perspectives class, and I was a big giver of missions. But later in my career, I began to just be burnt out on my job. Uh, I lost my joy, and I really believe, although work is hard, we should have joy in what we do. And I lost that joy, and so I began to really seek the Lord and say, Lord, what is it that you have for me? Because I've lost my joy, and I had it for so long. So I began to just pray, God, what do you have for me? So I was invited on a short-term mission trip to northern Kazakhstan, and we were in this very remote village near the Siberian border. And I got to know the families in this village. And one morning we had devotions as our team. And the man that invited us to come and to serve there said, you're here. Thank you for giving up your vacation. You're here because God has not forgotten his people. And those words struck my heart. And I wept for a week. And if you know me, I do not cry. But I cried for a week because what was head knowledge, that God so loved the world became heart knowledge. God loves the world. And I was changed at that time. So for me, I did have a dramatic calling. I was called during that trip. And I knew that I had to go home and change my life. So I came home. I quit my job. I quit my career, I went to seminary, I found a mission agency, and I served full-time since then. So you're never too old, because I'm really old, and I was called second career to go overseas. Um, but what my challenge is for you is if you don't have a heart for the lost, ask God to give you a heart for the lost. He can do that. He can give you a heart for the lost. And so I would just encourage you to ask him for a heart and ask him to break your heart for those things that break his heart. Who's next? Okay. Go ahead. Okay, kids, do you have your math head on? Kind of put your math head on because we're okay, good. So 66 years ago, got that number? Okay, 66 years ago, I was 12 years old. That's not old, right? 12 isn't, that is. <laughs> if you put the two together, it's, it's getting there. Anyway, so 66 years ago, when I was 12 years old, I went to a Bible camp. I had gone before, but I went to this Bible camp from my church, and we had, wait a second, is that burning bush the same as a burning branch? We had a name for him back then, but I won't repeat it, but anyway, so at the end of the service that evening, when we're all around the campfire, what we did was if you wanted to dedicate yourself, if you wanted to become a, a believer of Jesus, if you wanted to do something with your life, you would take this branch and you would go up to the fire and you were more or less saying to God, I'm going to serve you, blah, 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 whatever, and you'd throw the branch on the fire. And it was a dedication. I'll never forget it. So that one evening, I took that branch and I threw it on the fire, and I told the Lord that I wanted to be a missionary, and I was going to follow through. So I went to Bible camp. And then at Bible camp, I met this guy who, I mean, Bible camp, Bible school, when I graduated from high school. I went to Bible school. And then I met this guy that was going to be a preacher. So I was going to be a pastor's wife if I married him, and that meant I wasn't going to be a missionary. Is that a dilemma? A little bit of a dilemma. But anyway, 
So I went to the missionary who came home on furlough, who had also uh, encouraged me in missions, and I said to her, Bernice, I'm, I'm engaged. And she said, to who? And I told her, and I said, he's going to be a pastor. She said, but you said you were going to be a missionary. And I was in trouble. But I said, but, but I'm still going to be doing the work of missions. I was, had studied for a while. See, I got smarter. And so she said, but you said you'd be a missionary. Was it okay if I became a pastor's wife, do you think, kids? I think so, too. Because I was for 25 years. <laughs> But you know what? I was going to be a missionary in Africa. And I was going to be a missionary nurse in Africa. And you realize that here's your numbers again. Now you know how old I am. So about, uh, let's see, six years ago, we finally went to Africa. Because we had a new ministry. Were we still missionaries, do you think? Sure, we were still doing a mission that God called us to do in the Bible. He said, go and make disciples, right? You can do that as a pastor's wife. You can do that as a carpenter. You could dig ditches and do that with a person next to you. You can be a missionary. But it's really, really enjoyable to be overseas and do missions because now we've done it in the Philippines, in Ukraine, and this is, this is, we've lived in these places, and in Austria. So we had to learn Russian in, in Ukraine, Philippines speaks English, and, the, and in Austria we had to learn uh, German, except they spoke to us in dialects, so we got a little complicated sometimes. But anyway, so, but God is good, and he cares for you, so... To think that it took that many years before we landed in Africa is very interesting. But it really doesn't matter as long as you're serving the Lord. So I, I just will pray that you will grow up and serve the Lord somehow. Hi, I'm Carl. I go with her. Um, my, my call to missions was uh, different. I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, we had missionaries in church all the time, and I always thought they were weird, and many of them were. And I said, I will never, ever do that. I did not want to be weird, and I did not want to do anything like that. So I became a pastor. <laughs> I fought with God for six months <laughs> when I realized he wanted me in some kind of ministry. And finally I said, yes, if I have to, I don't want to be a missionary, I'll be a pastor. Well, little did I know. Uh, but I figured if I've got to go to a Bible college, that was the, th the thing. If you're going to be in ministry, you've got to do that. I looked all over the U.S., finally found a little school in northern Minnesota on a point between two lakes. I thought, if I've got to go to Bible college, I'll go where I can hunt and fish. And <laughs> that's me. <laughs> uh, anyway, I got up there, and that's where I met Joel Lynn. And we were pastor and wife for 25 years, but all that time, missions was in the background. We always enjoyed having missionaries in the church. At one point, we took our whole family to the Philippines for a year. Our kids, one of them hated it, one of them loved it, and the other one didn't care. Uh, but they had a good experience. They look back on it now. It was good. Uh, eventually, we got the burden from God to minister to those who minister. And that's what we do now. Pastors, missionaries, other Christian workers, where do they go when they have struggles? 
Where do they go when things are crashing down around them? That's where we fit in. Barnabas Ministries, Barnabas Counseling is our uh, ministry. We go wherever. We lived in Austria for 10 years. We taught counseling in Ukraine for a year. Uh, we've been going in and out of Ukraine for 10 years. Um, we go where God calls us. And we keep, that's our goal is to keep missionaries on the field instead of crashing and burning and have to come home. So uh, ministry can take a lot of forms. Your call can take a lot of forms. So uh, that's my story. I'm sticking with it. Okay, many of you know me. I am Anna Miller, and I'm and my husband Paul is not here. He's in Germany. We were in Germany for 20 years as missionaries. Um, when I graduated the university, I thought I, I became a Christian my junior year at the university. And so I, after I graduated, I thought I needed to become a missionary. And, um, and that verse that many of us know, Romans 10, 14, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? So I decided after I graduated, I was going to go into the mission field. I got an application. I could not fill that application out. Every, every day, I, okay, I'm going to spend an hour and fill out that application. I couldn't do it. I don't know why I couldn't do it. And finally, I just decided maybe God's not calling me. And this huge weight was lifted off of me. I didn't go. It was great. I mean, it was, I was trying to follow God. I didn't hear a call. I, everything you guys said, it was like, I needed a confirmation. That confirmation was I had no peace about filling out that application. Then I met my husband, Paul, and we ended up going into the mission field with Campus Crusade for Christ. And um, I just wanted to talk quickly about my call to go overseas. And I have mentioned this to some people. If you want to go overseas with your husband with Campus Crusade for Christ, Cru uh, Campus Crusade, you you have to have a call from God. And they asked me what my call was, and I said, I'm very willing to follow my husband. I'm just this wonderful, submissive wife. I, I really didn't want to go to Germany because I would rather stay here in the United States with my family. But I thought, okay, if God is calling us to go to Germany, I'll follow my husband. And they said, mm, sorry, you can't go unless you have a call yourself. And I really, we were... In our training, we were raising our support to go overseas, and if I did not receive a call, we would not be going to Germany. I, was, I felt horrible. I just started reading an Acts. The more I read an Acts, the more I decided I didn't want to go on the mission field. You all know what happened to Paul, right? He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was left for dead. He was in jail. And I'm like, I, I, I don't want to go. I'm going to Germany. It's a Western country. I wasn't going to Laos or Africa. But then I got to Acts 20. So I had to read 20 chapters before I got my call. In Acts 20, 22, the Apostle Paul had received many, many warnings. Do not go to Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, you will be bound and you will be put in jail. And the Apostle Paul says, and now comp compelled by the Spirit, he had to go. I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of, the grace of, of, the, of God's grace. There you go. I was like, all right, God. I need to finish the race, and that race is telling others about Jesus. You could do it any. <laughs> Where is your mission field? Is it here in the United States? We now work with international students who are here getting their a higher education um, in English, and then they go back to their home country. I cannot go to some of these countries and tell anybody about Jesus, but I can tell these people here in the United States about Jesus, and they go back to their home country. 
And there's many different ways getting involved with, with immigrants or, or, yeah, with immigrants that are coming here to Colorado, getting involved in inter um, with international students. So there's many, many, many ways to reach the world that God has brought into our backyard at this point. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jen Phillips. I'm, I'm better known as Lisa Eldfrick's uh, lesser known sister. <laughs> and I work with Child Evangelism Fellowship in Quebec. And I need two kids to come up and hold something for me. I saw that hand go up really fast, Claire. And I would normally pick my nieces, but I just can't take because I only need two. So I'm going to pick right there. I don't know your name, but yes. <laughs> I do have Grace, thank you. Grace and Claire. I need you each to hold one of these and show everybody. Make sure everybody gets to see it. So, And you can show the missionaries behind us, too, to make sure they get to see them. So we have two pencils here, and I need all the kids and all the adults to look at each pencil, and we're going to take a vote. Which one do you think represents a kid, and which one do you think represents an adult? Okay? So Ready? If you think the one that Claire has, the little one here, represents a kid, raise your hand. All right, that's a lot of hands. If you think the one that Grace has, that's the big one, represents a kid, raise your hand. Okay, we're divided, so we're going to have to figure this out. Well, let me see. If you're going to start school, Grace and Claire, and someone gives you a pencil for your whole school year, which one are you going to want? Uh, that one, right? because it still has a lot that you can use in it, right? You're not gonna get very far with this one. So for these two pencils, they remind me, this one reminds me of a kid. Why do you think? Does someone know why that big one? Great. Um, because um, so kids usually use pencils a lot, so a kid would have to use a bigger pencil than an adult. They would have to use a lot. They would have to even use the eraser too, right? And the eraser is big. But also it makes me think of how a kid has a lot of his life left, right? You guys, don't ha you guys have a lot of years left if the Lord lets you live on this earth for a long time. Whereas an adult, can we see yours again, Claire? It's so tiny. Look at the eraser. Is there an eraser on there? No. No, it's pretty much gone, right? <laughs> So even though God can use anyone, in Child Evangelism Fellowship, we believe in the importance of reaching children for Christ. So that's what our mission field is, is any child. And then we understand that if we reach them for Christ, they have, can you hold the big one up, their whole lives to live for the Lord. So thank you very much. I'm going to take them. Thank you so much. Can we give a hand to Grace and Claire? Good job. And so this pencil represents me because um, I had my whole life to live as a missionary because um, of people who invested. So my call, I think of the mobilizers who, were, who um, got me into the mission field. So um, first started with my parents who, uh, sorry, I get emotional, who uh, told me about Jesus from the time I was very little. And then um, my mom who taught, my, both my parents taught Sunday school together, which is really cool. Um, and my mom taught in the inner city of Denver, taught kids um, down in Five Points, and she would take us down there. So we got to see what um, working um, with people who don't know about Jesus was like. And so we were kids, but we also got to help sometimes. And then um, my mom got us into Child Evangelism Fellowship when I was the age of my niece, Summit, who well, I was a little bit older, but my sister and I, we did the same thing that Summit's been doing in the summers by telling people about Jesus. So by the time I was 15, I already knew how to um, proclaim the gospel and share it with other people, and I was given opportunities to do it. And then I stayed with CEF um, through uh, many summers, and then I began to volunteer. Someone voluntold me into um, coming to help me help in the once a week at, in the CEF office. And then um, after that, I decided to go full time. And um, the Lord used the national director in uh, Canada through a video who said, we need bilingual workers in Quebec. And I wasn't yet bilingual, but I was willing to work on it. And so the Lord called me to Quebec, Canada. So I think of my call was progressing, but it started when I was little. So um, I've just uh, two weeks ago celebrated being in Quebec for 20 years. And I have a few more years <laughs> left to go there, but I was able to start so early. So I think as we think about missions, all of our missions organizations, and as we think as families about missions, that we need to remember that it needs to start when um, we are children. So thank you. <laughs> yeah.
Uh, can we run that video for Pulse there? Anybody back there? Hola, Red Rock. Somos Poli Tania Estier de Honduras y nos. Technical difficulties. Hola, Red Rock. Somos Poli Tania Estier de Honduras y nuestra hija Ashley. Hello, Red Rocks. We are Paul and Tanya Steer from Honduras and our daughter Ashley. Queremos enviarles un especial saludo. We want to send you a special greetings. Y darles muchas gracias por sus oraciones y por ser parte de nuestras vidas. We are thankful for all your prayers and for being part of our lives. Nos sentimos muy emocionados de poder enviar este saludo este día a ustedes. We are very excited to send these Greetings to you this day. Así que Dios les bendiga. God bless you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Hola. Buenos dias. My name is Matt Nita, even though my name tag says Paul S. Not for Paul Warrington or Paul Miller. Um, obviously, uh, Paul and Tanya couldn't be here today. They're down in Honduras. Um, it would take special visa for them to come up and visit with us. So they are not able to be with us today. Uh, but uh, again, they send their greetings um, and their blessings to the church. Now, I am not a missionary like those behind me. Uh, I attend Red Rocks Fellowship here, and usually I'm in the back, so this is really kind of weird being able to see faces, because usually I see the backs of your heads. Um, but uh, uh, today I'm representing Paul and Tanya, and um, uh, Sue Raritan had asked me to get some information about Paul and Tanya, and so I got some information about how to contact them, uh, how to get on their mailing list for their missionaries' notes, uh, how to contribute towards their uh, financial needs, um, those kinds of things. So if you want to just come out and visit the table, um, feel free to do that, and you can pick up some information. I also have uh, pictures from the last mission trip that we took earlier this year, as well as two other previous mission trips that we had taken uh, down to Honduras. Now, Paul had sent a uh, rather lengthy uh, email to us in Spanish, which Mark uh, translated for me. Um, Paul is under Mission Stores, which is, again, with Mark Jones. And uh, we've gone down there several times to work with uh, Paul and Tanya and uh, do some of the work down there, building uh, a house, building a church, uh, putting on rooftops, doing uh, erosion mitigation, um, all kinds of different types of uh, ministry work um, involved uh, with their, their ministry. Uh, it was interesting, in, in part of the letter, Paul talks about uh, how they got involved in the ministry. Originally, what they were doing was uh, food distribution and helping the church uh, distribute few food to the communities. And through this work, they were able to uh, join uh, ministry work and be able to get into some of the schools down in Honduras. Uh, we actually visited one of the schools and they had a all school assembly, and we were able to share um, the gospel message at a school, which obviously you can't do that here in the States. And so it was very interesting being able to do that and to visit some of the classrooms and talk with the kids. Um, a lot of their ministry is involved with the communities. Uh, they particularly um, approach the younger generations because Honduras is a strictly Catholic uh, country, and so uh, it's easier to reach out to some of the younger people that have opportunities to leave the Catholic Church and not have repercussions of um, being ostracized from the, the community. And so they spend a lot of time working with the, the youth and uh, the communities down there. And I just wanted to share just one paragraph of the, the letter that uh, Paul sent. Um, you can read the entire letter at the table that I'm at, which is right outside the door. Uh, it says, today we are working in 25 small villages in two cities, and we are building three resource centers. 
missionary training centers, and churches. Work which we do together with you, impacting lives in 2022. In this way, we have reached 1,200 families directly, taking, them f taking food to them, teaching bread making, sewing, painting, and agriculture. We are training 130 new believers and coming close to influencing 4,000 families in the Comayagua region. So we um, took a trip earlier this year. We went down to Comayagua, and outside of Comayagua, there's a, uh, the mountains, and we went up past the little area called Tintel, up to an area called Granadilla. And if you come to visit uh, the tables, you'll be able to see pictures that I took of the Granadilla area. Uh, one of the needs that uh, we were kind of joking about um, is that they need money for tires for their ATVs. Um, they're up in the mountains and they uh, have these dirt roads and even one of the ATVs got stuck. And we looked at the tires and basically they're bald. And if you were driving here in the States, you would pretty much be required to get new tires. And so that's one of the, the basic needs that they have. And anytime that you want to contribute towards their ministry, um, again, I have the information that you can uh, uh, contact them and be involved in their ministry through their web page. Um, I jokingly said that one of the things that I personally would like to see is for them to get a hot water heater. Um, we took showers that were so cold. Um, Obviously, they wouldn't be able to have a hot water heater because they would need energy to run those, electricity. Up in the um, Grenadilla area, they don't have electricity. They don't have cell phone connections, uh, very limited. And so, um, but their ministry uh, definitely has some, some needs. And if you would pray for them, and again, if you're interested in being involved in their ministry, um, we will probably take another trip down there at some point. But um, feel free to stop by the table, get their information, their contact information, and how to contribute to their ministry, and I'm sure they'll appreciate it. Again, thank you for um, being involved in the ministry here at the church. Again, I'm not a missionary. I'm just a member of the church. And so if you, if you see me um, being involved in missions, that means you guys can be involved as well. So feel free to talk to me about that, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, I'm maybe a familiar face, but maybe not known by my name. I'm Diane Blackwell, and I work with Bridges International alongside my husband. We've been in Denver for 27 years. We've worked with Campus Crusade for 44 years in different places, different universities throughout the U.S. But um, I wanted to just maybe focus on the key events that have happened in my life that made me um, consider and also develop a mind, a mindset, a heart for uh, reaching the lost. And the first one was when um, a woman with Campus Crusade came randomly to my door and knocked and asked if I could do a survey with her. So we went through the survey and it was a long that same timeline, I was asking questions about my father's death, and where is he, and, you know, I don't know if he's a believer, and so she answered very um, carefully and thoughtfully, and at the end of that time, she asked me, would you like to trust Christ with what, you know, he did on the cross for you, and I said, yes, and that's the most joyful sound that she had that day was when I said yes to Jesus. And so from that point on, she started grounding me in the word and uh, helping me establish my walk with God. And through discipleship that we do with uh, students, it's the same thing that she did with me, just grounding me in my faith and uh, showing me God's heart for the lost. And that, that is something that was my responsibility as a child of God. That, you know, not only do I have the position of being a child, but I had responsibilities, and this was sharing with others and grounding them in the word was part of that responsibility. Just like every one of your children have responsibilities at home. You're, um, you teach them specific things, and this woman taught me specific things about my responsibility as a 
child of God. So that was a really significant formation in my, my life. And as a result of that, I started, when I was in college, reaching out to international students, my classmates, women from Iran or uh, from Africa. I just say, hey, let's go get coffee. Can I just get to know you? And it was through that that I started sharing my faith with them. That was one of the important things was to start practicing those things that are part of my responsibility, reaching the loss and discipling other people. And so I practiced that as a student. And I, in the whole process, I began to see God was widening my heart to care for more people than just my family or just myself. And I went on a summer missions with a crew to Santa Cruz, you know, a beach summer project. Who wants that? Yeah, everybody does. I went there, and God used that a significant event there. We, um, our landlord died unexpectedly in his garage, and I happened to be the first person to find him. And so I had to go call his wife and have her, you know, make the appropriate calls. But that was, God said, life is a vapor. People matter. What do you want to do with that? And right then, that was the moment that it was like, that's what I want to do is invest in people. And I want to invest in international students. So that's my direction uh, came during that time. And, um, and it happened that night, too. God was just like, God, you just have everything so planned out. That night, um, our, our team leader shared about, really, I think it was timely because he talked about what lasts forever. And he used scripture in Isaiah about, you know, the flower fading, but the word of God lasts forever. And then in uh, Romans, just about, you know, eternal destination of every person. Where are, you gonna, where are we going to spend eternity? Are we going to be eternally in hell or in the presence of God? And those, that talk that night was another reinforcer in my, my direction in life. And um, so it was God's word. It was the experiences that I had, but just what God had done in my life that directed me to become a full-time missionary with Campus Crusade. So I love that, and I would love to, that's one of my heart, is to mobilize, to try to help other believers really see what our responsibilities are as a child of God. Uh, my name is Ben, and I go with Diane. Both of us are serving with Bridges International. Um, I have been called, I knew that I was called um, from the age of about eight to be a forester. So that was my calling. I knew that I was going to follow my brother into the profession of forestry, and that's what I did, and I grew up knowing exactly what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And so I went to college, got my degree, got out, got a professional job, and there I was. I was a forester. I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus at that time. But uh, it was out after graduating from college and working in my profession and uh, supposedly having everything, you know, I thought I wanted, that I began, God began to touch me and just, you know, why are you here? Who am I? What's my relationship with you? Uh, what's the purpose of your life? Things like that. So it was about two years out of college that I actually began a personal relationship with Christ with the help of uh, many friends. But uh, um, God began a process of calling, recalling me, um, and using the scriptures tremendously. I know uh, Anne has already used one that God used powerfully in my life of Everyone, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall it be saved in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear unless there's a preacher? And God began to use scriptures like that in my life and surrounded me with people that had this amazing vision for 
reaching the world. And I thought, wow, that seems pretty significant. And so with all these people around me and God kept using the scriptures, uh, one of the things that he, uh, the, the scripture he used powerfully in my life was in Second Peter, when God says, uh, uh, through Peter, he says, uh, God is not slow, as some count slowness, but he is patient, not wishing for any to perish. And he goes on to say, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And the earth and the heavens and all the works of the earth shall be burned up. And so I, I began to drill that into my head. And, uh, and I began to see my life as a forester. And I thought, this is what I want to do all my life. But then he says, when I get to the end of my life, I turn around and I see God coming behind going just. I says, what? What can I invest my life in that's going to last forever? And as Diane mentioned, there's a few things that last for eternity. And so that verse goes on to say, then, uh, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of men, people, men, women, ought you to be looking forward to and hastening the day of the Lord? I thought, wow. I can look forward to his coming, but there's something going on here where I can be a part of hastening the day of the Lord. I said, what is that? And you go back to Matthew 24, when he says, and this gospel shall be preached to all the nations, and then the end shall come. It's like, wow, that's it. I can have a significant impact on people in this life, but also for eternity. And I can also have a part in his plan of returning. So all these things God just kind of wove, wove into a big tapestry in calling and, you know, as maybe as, you know, little burning bushes along the way. And I appreciate the way you guys presented that. Thank you. Uh, but that's how God called me to be involved in that great commission, no matter where it led me. And it led me to Campus Crusade for Christ and uh, led me to meet my beautiful wife and uh, been doing what we've been doing for, for years. So, um, should we? No, we've, we've gone too long. I was going to say, if there's any burning questions, please come to our tables out there. Uh, we're also going to have lunch together, and we can talk over lunch uh, to clarify anything that was said up here. Uh, but again, I know on behalf of all of us, we just appreciate this congregation. And um, being, Okay. Let me pray for us. Father, we come to you always and only because of the grace and mercy you've given us in Christ. We come to you by your invitation, uh, and we just want to thank you. Thank you for your work in our lives individually, each person in this room, um, each missionary, the missionaries that aren't here um, with us. Just thank you for your work and your invitation into that work um, with each one of our lives. Uh, continue to uh, work on us. Thank you for the fellowship that's coming up with each other uh, over meal and uh, just continue to use this day, this morning, and this fellowship to accomplish your purpose in our lives. Thank you. Amen.